Welcome to Maximize Your Influence, your resource for the top persuasion, influence, and negotiation techniques that will help you maximize your success in life and business. And now, here are your hosts, Kurt Mortensen and Steve Olson. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Maximize Your Influence. I'm Steve Olson. I've got Kurt Mortensen here with me. Kurt, what's new? Hey, I'm here and feeling good, and it was a great holiday weekend. So feeling pretty good with barbecue in me and some boating and some sun, and it's always good. Do a little more relaxing during the week. Yeah, wow, if every weekend could be that way. You know what I love about the three-day weekend is it also translates into a short week, so it's just doubly good. I love it. <laughs> It is. It's, it's good all the way around. We need to just cancel like a lot of the government uh, agencies have done. Just cancel Friday. Nah, we can't afford it. Just take Friday off. <laughs> we need to get French. They've got that 30-hour work week, and we need to do that. <laughs> yeah, that'll help the economy. <laughs> 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 yeah, let's work less. Let's do this. Yeah, let's just not worry about it. Let's get you more vacations and work less and... Uh, economy will improve that would probably be better than a lot of the things that they're trying to do now to stimulate the economy <laughs> just it actually is i mean most people could do more in a 30 hour work week than when they're doing right now but the concern would be they're just going to be doing less but if you're really productive you could really hammer out probably in 20 30 hours you've probably read the four hour work week where you're just getting it done you're concentrating you're working smart there might be some truth to maybe shortening the work week that's totally how i am if you give me a little bit of time to accomplish something i can do it if you give me a lot of time, I will take that time. Yeah, that's what they say. When you give a, someone a project, it always expands to the time allotted that you give them to uh, finish it. And it's always going to be done on the due date. That's how it is with my daughter. She's six years old, and she's in a stage where she changes her clothes about 70 times a day. Oh, fun. Yeah, it's great. My wife's a clean freak, so it drives her nuts. So if we send her off to her room, hey, go clean up your room if you want to play with your friends or whatever, and we don't give any kind of a time limit, she just dilly-dallies, accomplishes nothing. But if, if we get upset and say, okay, I'm setting the timer. If this stuff isn't gone in 15 minutes, then it's going into a timeout or it's going to wherever. And she goes crazy and she gets it done because we cramp down that time. <laughs> nothing like a sense of urgency with a consequence when you're dealing with kids. <laughs> nothing like it. <laughs> I sometimes wonder if we overuse it, but it works too well. Yeah, it's one of the easier forms of persuasion, but with kids that don't have that frontal lobe, sometimes it's the only thing that works. Now, what in the world are you talking about, frontal lobe? We're not all brain <laughs> surgeons on the, uh, on the well, podcast here. People, a lot of people ask you, well, do these laws of persuasion work with kids? And so, well, yeah, but you have to understand that teenagers especially are different because the brain actually matures from the back to the front. Let me ask you this. When is the brain fully developed, do you think? Well, I actually know the answer, so I'll, I'll just pretend I'm guessing. Um, 15 <laughs> years old? Uh, well, it's around probably 22, 23, maybe sometimes 25. The brain is fully developed. And the last thing to develop is the frontal lobe, which is responsible for forecasting and consequences. And, and at that age, teenagers especially don't get it that if they play Xbox for three hours, it's going to affect their grades. They don't realize they get a tattoo on their neck. It might affect their long-term employment. <laughs> It just doesn't really register in their brain. And so for teenagers and kids, like you mentioned, it's all about the now. There's a timer. When they think they have all the time in the world or have that perception, they will take all that time in the world. So you have to make these consequences and these deadlines much shorter so that it fits in their world because two weeks from now doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. In a teenager's mind, they're invincible. So about the now, about the consequences, about how it's going to affect them now is going to have more effect than in the future. Right. That's kind of scary. You've got these college students making decisions about their major and what they're going to do the rest of their life, and they're doing this when their brain's not fully developed. <laughs> that is a challenge, and that's why I see college students bouncing from major to major, not sure what to do. You see a lot of freshmen falling out because they're just they've taken all these classes, and none of them were really that good. But when you're taking GE, of course they're not that good because they're just they're GE. They're things you have to take, but will probably never use again in your life, as we talked about before. Yeah. Another reason, too, why people who, who tend to get married really young, right out of high school and such, five, six years later, they feel like they don't even know the person. Yeah, because they have changed. Now, when they change together, it actually works out. But when they change apart, 
that's when there's consequences. That's a good point. That's a good point. If, if they grow through it and they change together, then it's just stronger. But they could definitely wake up a decade later. If they didn't run that marriage the right way, if they didn't do the things to make a successful marriage, that would be a problem. Well, I have a few announcements regarding how to listen to this show and, and what we're doing there. As we talked about last time, we're up on Stitcher. That's great. We're working on getting the direct links to the podcast up on the blog at MaximizeYourInfluence.com. That's where you can read quick summaries on the show and, and listen to and download the show on your own. But we're always happy to have you on iTunes. That's where we have a pretty big presence. We're up on BlackBerry as well. We're up on the Windows Marketplace. However, I was informed by the guy over at Microsoft the other day that they don't give out direct links to the show or any show with the Windows Marketplace, so we're not going to be able to get up a direct link. But we will be able to do that for Stitcher, for iTunes, for BlackBerry. Uh, we're also working on TuneIn. We want you to have lots of ways to be able to listen to the show. In fact, I was at a car dealership over the weekend. We're thinking about getting another car. And, hey, great marketing for Stitcher. They're actually getting in all of the GM and Chevy vehicles. You can just punch up Stitcher as well as Pandora on your nav system and listen to podcasts right in the car, which I thought was pretty cool. That is that is great marketing, right? You have that captive audience, and it's great marketing. Yeah, it's great. Whoever closed that deal, we're going to put them on as the Persuasion Ninja here in a few shows. Yeah. Closed a big deal. But we welcome your comments at MaximizeYourInfluence at gmail.com. Show suggestions, hate mail, we'd love to get some of that and pick through that as long as it has some substance to it. And anything else that you want to tell us, Maximize Your Influence at gmail.com. Anyways, that was a tangent. So, talking about Apple. And they have an event coming up on September 10th. And I wanted to talk about, for a minute, branding and marketing and why Apple has been so successful. This is something that has been discussed ad nauseum in books and in the media and on blogs, why Apple is so great. But when something is so great, I think it's always beneficial to continually study it. Granted, these events that they do... They're not quite what they used to be, especially when Steve Jobs was around. That uh, new Steve Jobs movie is getting horrible reviews, by the way. So they do these events, and I don't know, what, what do you think, Kurt? What makes people go out, like me, because I am one of the mindless drones, when Apple releases a new product, I, I get into a trance, and I get in my car, and I go to the store, and I buy it. What's happening there? <laughs> Well, you're hypnotized. <laughs> you're under the spell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I guess we can move on. I'm hypnotized. There we go. It's that. Well, Apple's been great. They've been around for a while. And we know they deliver an incredible product. They do have a great product. And there's no doubt about that. And you've used it. You're a product of the product. And so you know when you buy the next one that you're going to like it. That's a big part of it, too. But then it's also almost like a, a selective group, a membership. It's almost like a religion to where you have the minority people that are Apple people that are getting the iPhones or getting the computers to where they feel part of, maybe part of something. They feel like it's maybe even part of their personality. When you meet someone that has another Apple, I would bet there's a kind of an instant connection. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's just something about people that are using Apple and they've kind of built up this brand to where the people that have the brand are willing to pay more. They're willing to stand in line. They're willing to do these things to have that Apple. Yeah, they, they certainly are. And I look at them and I go, Apple really had a long-term plan. There was a marketing genius over there that had a long-term plan. I sometimes call it the drug dealer close, but it would be more ethically called the foot in the door. If you remember back in, I don't know if it was 2002, maybe 2003, Apple was, eh, they were they were around, but then they came out with the iPod, which was revolutionary and now we look retroactively here and we see that people that got hooked on the iPod they also got hooked on the Apple Store and they noticed that the iPod worked better with the new laptops that were coming out and the new computers and then they got Apple TV and I think they made it they made it a very easy way to get in the iPod it was back then it was a good chunk of change but it's definitely on the cheaper end of the spectrum and they have all these products that make it really easy to get in and to say, I'm in that Apple community. I buy Apple products. And so the next time 
they need to get a computer, they need to replace their PC, they've been walking around with that cool iPod, and it's got the little Apple on the back, and it's hip, and it's it's the neat thing to do. So now they're going to buy the computer. And I've, I've found that once you do that, very rarely do people go back. I think the lesson that we could learn as persuaders there is what is a very simple and easy way to get people in the door, to get them at least using and noticing your product and appreciating it. And a lot of times companies will lose money in order to do that because they understand the lifetime value of the customer. I wonder what the lifetime value of an Apple customer is. It's probably pretty high. Oh, I'd say tens of thousands of dollars. They are perfect, like you mentioned, with a foot in the door, just get started, everyone's using it. They're great. Every Apple user is an evangelist <laughs> telling others how great it is that they need to get one. I also love how Apple just doesn't play well with others. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> this is Apple. I'm not running your Windows stuff here. You go, you Windows people, you go over there. This is Apple. We have our own software. We're doing this. We're not going to play with you. We're not going to do your standard. This is Apple. Just like Southwest. They don't play well with others. If you want to book Southwest, you want to fly Southwest, you have to go to Southwest. No one else is going to sell their tickets. They do their own thing. And look at the profitability of Southwest versus some of the other airlines. And it's a simple business model. Apple doesn't have a lot of products, but the products that they do are considered by most people to be the best. We're going to get some droid hate mail here, I'm sure, or some Samsung Galaxy hate mail. But <laughs> most people th that operate them consider them to be the best. It reminds me of... Yeah, out west here we have in and out Burger. They've got like three things on the menu, but people love it. They go crazy for it. It has very, very simple, and it's great model to where you don't have to complicate things that you can be profitable being simple. Yeah. Well, we'll see what they do on September 10th, what they release to We Mindless Drones, what we're going to go out and buy. I'll have to save up a little bit of cash because I will be at the Apple store most likely <laughs> shortly thereafter. <laughs> Standing in line at midnight, being one of the first. Standing in line at midnight. Yeah, looking forward <laughs> to it. Go, go, go! I hear the sound. Ooh, we love that sound. It's we the love the sound. The new sound. That's right, Homer Simpson. Yeah, I don't know if we can say that. I'm sure we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see if Homer makes an appearance on yeah, the next any, episode. Any lawyers out there, no, send us an email if we can or cannot say that. <laughs> that's right. Let us know. But uh, that's that's the blunder incoming. It is Labor Day weekend, or at least it was a couple of days ago, and my wife and I are in the market for a new car. It's time to get one, and this guy was greasy. <laughs> because we all know the whole, well, let me go talk to my manager. I mean, it, it was in full force. Yeah. And I, I think i, I got to ask you a question. Yeah, did, go ahead. They, did they lose your trade-in? No, I don't have a trade-in. Oh, I was going to say, because a lot of times, oh, we can't find it. and That's kind of the <laughs> oldest trick in the book. Then you have to talk to somebody. That There you go. There you go. Well, this guy, it was just, I'm surprised that they keep using this, but I guess they they wouldn't use it unless it worked, which that says something about humanity. <laughs> <laughs> we went, they gave us terms on the sale. It wasn't exactly what I wanted to hear. He goes back, well, let me check on something. He comes back, and guess what? They magically got better. Oh, what do you know? You were probably just so shocked. <laughs> and Right, just trying to frame how I perceived this. And I said, well, we really want bucket seats in the back. And, well, let me go check. It came back, and it got better. But the funny thing was, is we had an expectation of what we wanted, what we'd be willing to pay, and they're just contrasting us. They're going so much more than what we wanted to do, and then they keep going down and going down. And I know that they're wanting us to end up much higher than where we originally wanted to be, but they know that they can't just get there in one shot. They have to slowly drag down your will and beat your expectations to a pulp by all these meetings going back to the manager over and over again. And I would have gone to that CarMax place if they had the car that I wanted because I was just so tired of the, the song and dance that was just so transparent. And that is the blunder for the week, <laughs> Kurt. It is. It makes people tense and uneasy, but it does work some of the time. You know, even a blind pig can find food. <laughs> yeah. Meaning that, you know, it does work on some people. And part of it's the contrasting where they're trying to adjust your perception of value, adjust what you're willing to pay. But also, you're committing so much time and so much energy and so many I'm gonna say resources being there. The time you're there, one hour, two hour, three hour, you don't want to go through that again. That's part of wearing you down also to where you just say, all right, let's just do it. Let's just take care of it. Let's just go because you don't want to do that again. You don't want to go through that again. 
it is old style, it is old school, and a definite blunder because you saw right through it. And when you see right through something like that, it has the opposite effect. Maybe everybody doesn't. Granted, what I do for a living, I see through a lot of that stuff. So I'm probably not the best person to talk about these kind of blunders. I think, too, it goes back to what we've talked about on a lot of the previous episodes. Did you did you know this guy? He didn't ask us any questions until we got down to numbers. He didn't ask us about, what have you looked at so far? Where have you been? What's going on with the family? Why do you want this kind of car? I think if he if we felt like he understood a little bit about where we were coming from and what we wanted and needed, then maybe we would have given him a little bit more permission to do these kinds of things. But just doing it out of the chute, we're not going back. We've already made that decision. We're going to go to a different dealership. We still want the same car, but we just don't feel like we're going to get what we need from this guy, and we might not get it at all. It kept going through my head what you talked about, how many people buy a car from the same salesman more than once. And how it was almost nobody. Yeah, a lot of times they just sit there and they don't ask the questions. It would be pretty simple. What's the most important thing about? What do you think about this? What do you do? Well, here it is. This is the best model for you versus they vomit all the features, hoping one of those will stick. And we've all heard this before. You know, it's the benefit, not the feature. But the reality is, and the reason they do this is sometimes when they say a feature, your brain triggers a benefit and it works. If they say it's a 450 horsepower engine, you might be going, yeah, giddy up. But to some people, they don't really know what that means, and they can't assign a benefit to it, and that's when it has the opposite effect. And so they're just vomiting, hoping something will stick versus doing it the right way. Yeah. Uh, Well, that's where the blunder goes out to. We'll probably have many car dealer blunders people will send in. Over the years here, they're just, (laughs) they're pretty low-hanging fruit on the on the ladder of blunders. <laughs> yeah, I think they were at the bottom of the barrel on our trust scale, too, as far as the professions that are trusted. That's correct. Which politicians, we've got all this in, in the news about the Middle East and, and possible war there. We've, we've had plenty of that going on, and I'm sure politicians are going to be taking another hit. It sounds uh, eerily like the story we've heard over and over again about this is happening, that's happening, we need to blow some stuff up. I think a lot of people are really tiring on that that side of things, too. And that's just what's in the news is overwhelmingly here in America and in Britain. We I know we have a lot of listeners over in the U.K. Everybody is telling their leaders, talk to Congress, talk to Parliament. We elect these people for a reason. We're, we're tired of one guy making a decision and blowing a bunch of things up. Yeah, I don't know if they really could take a hit. They're pretty low already, but they might be going below the used car salesman here pretty quick. I would have put them down there already below the used car salesman. It's a, that's an insult to used car salesman everywhere, Kurt. <laughs> well, they're below lawyers, so lawyers, that they're happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, politicians are all former lawyers almost always. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Maybe that explains a lot. Well, okay, why don't we get into some information that the listeners can, can take and apply in their businesses and in their lives today. And we had a lot of comments about what we touched on briefly the last show. The last show we got into negotiation a lot. We got on a little bit of a tangent on inoculation. People want to know more about that. You say, hey, you can overcome an objection and make it not ever come up in the first place. People get excited. They think, wow, you mean I don't have to deal with objections? Well, for the most part, that's true. If you can structure your presentation and your sales pitch and your marketing correctly, these prospects can be delivered to you with many of these things that are the bane of your existence, these objections that are your life every day that you're always having to solve. We can make those go away in advance. So due to listener demand, we're going to really start laying out that concept of inoculation today in more detail for you to use. Kurt, if you could give a 20-second summary, because like I said, we did it on the last show to a degree, what is inoculation? Pre-solving the objections before they happen. And I've got time left over. How's that? (laughs) You do have time left over. So I've found that a good way to do that, and I learned this from you, is to use the simple acronym. This applies to other things, which is TESS. T-E-S-S. Stands for Testimonial, Example, Story, and Statistic. So it turns out if you've got objections on, let's say, a competitor. Maybe there's a competitor out there that, that has a lot of advertising going out, and you're finding that your prospects always bring this up. You could pick a testimonial, an example, a story, or statistic 
build that into your pitch that is specifically geared toward taking the legs out from underneath the competitor in a tactful way. We're not being negative. We're not bagging on people. And that is going to reduce the effect that that objection has in the future, if not completely eliminate it. Am I right there? You're exactly right. And it's so important to do that because old school training will teach you, oh, objections are good. It indicates interest. Well, you're not going to solve all the objections, but objections really aren't that good because their mind's hitting a brick wall. And I've done this before in front of live audiences where I'm talking about this persuasion software I've created that solves all the objections for them, has a list of all the objections and what they can say. And, and as I'm talking about them, I'm holding up one of those, remember those big old floppies? Yeah. With that five and a half. So I'm holding it up and they're looking at me like I'm stupid. But the reality is I do that because in their mind they're like, I haven't seen one of those before. I don't have a computer that'll play one of those. Is he stupid? I think he's stupid. Wait a minute. He might be serious. Is he really doing that? So I'm talking about all these benefits of this persuasion software and how it's going to help them out. And they're mentally, they've hit that brick wall. So if you don't want your prospect to do that, you want to be able to pre-solve objections before they happen during your presentation, and then they are able to persuade themselves. So you're saying then... You're, you're holding up this antiquated floppy disk, saying that you've got this new high-tech persuasion software that makes all of their problems go away. But because that objection hung up, or that objection came up, they're not hearing anything that you're saying about the true merits of this software. So what we have to do is, is solve these, get them out of the way along the way, because once that objection comes up, whether they verbalize it, whether they don't, it's hanging there, and it's preventing them from seeing the true benefits, correct? Exactly. They're mentally, they're stuck. That's what they're thinking about. They can't get past that. And your presentation keeps going, but they're stuck five minutes in the past. Right. So what are, and I'm, I'm sure the listeners could probably tell this, but just in case they don't, if, if they don't know these, what are the most common general objections that we want to inoculate against? Oh, price would be one. Time could be another one having to talk to a spouse or a partner, any of those that you're getting again and again would be ones that you would want to inoculate. Now, you're not just inoculating against every possible objection you might ever get in the whole world because, A, you'll probably kill them with all that inoculation you just put in them, and B, you've, you've probably given them reasons not to do it. Yeah, they were concerns that they hadn't thought of before, and you brought them, brought them up, and now they're saying, hey, I don't like that. Exactly. I, I hadn't thought of that. But the common stuff, the price, the the third party decision maker, like a spouse or something that isn't there. And what was the other one you said? I know it, but I can't I'm coming up blank. Time was the other one. Got it. Got it. So what we could do then, for example, I've found that in the marketing and in the front end work that I'm doing, previous to setting the appointment, in the literature that goes out, I've found that that's time to start preparing for the decision maker side of things, at least in my career. I know, for example, a lot of my clients use financing. And if we don't know for a fact that they are approved for financing, I could go through a whole big deal with them to find out they can't even buy a property in the first place. So one thing that I do, and I've actually found it's a good measure of posture, is I make them get pre-qualified for financing by a third party. So not only does it get the foot in the door, they've already taken steps towards doing the deal, but now I know money's out of the equation and to a degree a third party decision maker's out of the equation because the finance company already said yes and is already willing to give them the money. And that's perfect. You've pre solved it, you're saving time, and that's why inoculation is so important is pre solving those objections that enables you to focus on the other issues that you need to solve. Yeah. I, I found too that the story the story is so effective in inoculating because maybe you think or maybe if you just present your product as it is people might think it's too much money they have that value knee-jerk reaction but if you can tell a good and relevant story that talks about somebody else that was in their position and and what they went through and where they went what they found and establish some value benchmarks you can start to knock that stuff down so that when money does come out when it is time to talk about that, it's not as much of a shock or it's not a shock at all to the person. You think there's merit to, to using the story to inoculate against these things? Oh, absolutely. Stories persuade without detection. 
And that is a wonderful thing for persuaders because we've talked about it before. The moment they sense you're trying to persuade them, are going to resist you. You tell a story, they listen. We love stories. They grab people's attention. And we put ourselves in the story. We live the story. Granted, you need to be a good storyteller and keep it short and sweet. It needs to be relevant. But a great story persuades without detection. Because I can tell you, oh, you need life insurance. I need life insurance. You need life insurance. Don't wait. Don't procrastinate. Versus a story of someone who put it off, had little kids at home, something happened on the drive home. They can see that. They feel it. They persuade themselves because they've put themselves in that story. Yeah, or even the story of had Bob and Susie in here the other day, and they had been to this place, and and they found that as they they looked for this, that it wasn't all that it cracked up to be, and it was great because we were able to get them to something for much less than they thought. Basically, hitting on the fact that yeah, there are other options out there, but people time and time again come to me and tell me what I like most about your product is this because everybody else out there didn't have it. Yeah, things look cheaper originally but I found that it wasn't really what I needed. And, and I think that's a, a really subtle way of getting that in their brain so that they're understanding that. Because if you offic- if you do have that, oh, the price thing, and that knee-jerk reaction comes out, your ability to control it is so much more limited. It's so much better to, to define that playing field of where we're going to talk about price beforehand. I agree, because price usually is a knee-jerk reaction anyway. And when you keep getting price as an objection as a persuader, you've blown your presentation. You haven't built the value. And that's something you can do right up front. If they're spending $100 and getting $200 in value, that's a no-brainer. Yeah, it seems so much like old-school persuasion, the old-school closing and and objection solving, is based almost entirely around putting Band-Aids on knee-jerk reactions. (laughs) And just going around and trying to limit those and and knowing that, hey, they're going to have this knee-jerk reaction, so... I'm, I'm going to make it really bad, like the car dealer. I'm going to make it really bad and then come back with something a little bit better. When all that does is create clients who who feel a little bit jerked around and screwed, they're not going to come back. But people will find that if they use inoculation effectively, it's just a higher form of persuasion here, that people will come back over and over again, and you have that high level of trust where they're just willing to do what you recommend down the road. Absolutely. And you, you've heard me say it before that, Closing skills is like trying to get a kiss after a bad date. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> if they don't like you, they don't trust you, they haven't asked you the right questions, it doesn't matter if you have a clever phrase or a close. You've got to spend more time opening them up, asking questions, inoculating, building the value. And then when you get to that close or the call to action, whatever you want to call it, it's simple, it's easy, it doesn't surprise them, and you don't have to pull out any closes. Yeah, I think the takeaway then would be We're looking at your persuasive presentation or your pitch, whatever you want to call it. What are the top objections that you're having that you're finding yourself continually having to solve and fight against? Let's identify those and then let's pick out what are the testimonials, the examples, the stories, the statistics, use tests that you can weave through your branding, your marketing, your advertising, the initial phases of your pitch so that when people come to you they are as qualified a prospect as possible and we have as many of these objections out of the way as possible already because whether it's on your postcards your commercials your email marketing your webinars you have addressed these things via tests ahead of time anything you'd want to add to that Kurt well test is an incredible thing when you're talking to somebody one-on-one but it's even better when you're talking to a group because each one of those resonates with different personalities. So as you start using those testimonials, examples, statistics, stories, try to adapt it to their personality. Try to adapt it to your presentation. Try to adapt it to your own personality. So, for example, if I'm talking to a diehard analytical accountant, I'm probably using a lot more statistics than I am stories. And when we can really peg the person, use the right testimonial example, statistic, or story, we inoculate then again, they're going to persuade themselves. Right. So try to use it all. You cast a wide net when it comes to your marketing and advertising to get people interested. But once you zero into that one-on-one presentation, you've got to start to get a feel for your prospect and what kind of person they are. Do they like the stories or do they like the statistics, for example? That'll be something that we get into on personality types in future podcasts. Well, good. 
Everybody, get out there, use tests. Let's knock these objections out ahead of time. Make everybody's life easier, a happier client, a wealthier persuader. Nothing wrong with that. Anything you'd like to add, Kurt, before we wrap it up for the day? Yeah, let me just add a study with an inoculation. A study was done with a group of people who were about to be persuaded. So the intention was to change their attitude about a certain topic. So one group was told they were going to be exposed to a message that would attempt to persuade them, and the other group did not receive that warning. So the results showed that the group that was warned up front were actually persuaded less than the group that did not receive the warning. So this is important. So when you're ever attempting to persuade someone, you never say, you never start out, today I'm going to persuade you, today I'm going to sell you, because you've done reverse inoculation to where now they're putting up the barriers to put up the brick wall before you've even started. All right. Good points. Good points. Well, everybody, let's take it and run. We will have you on another episode of Maximize Your Influence here shortly. We're enjoying the show. Send your feedback to Maximize Your Influence at gmail.com and have a great day. Take care, everyone. 